Good day. I'm Allison Jones, Director of Conferences for Index Universe, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm pleased to be joined on the call today by three leading experts on ETFs and sector investing. Our first expert speaker is Mabane Faber. Mabane is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Cambria Investment Management and has been a leader in implementing innovative active strategies using ETFs for years. Joining Meb on the line is David Botset, Senior Vice President of ETFs for Guggenheim, which has built up one of the most innovative suites of sector and thematic ETFs on the market today. And finally, we have our own Matt Hogan, who you all are familiar with as our President of ETF Analytics and Global Head of Editorial for Index Universe. This is the latest in our monthly series of webinars we are dubbing the Alpha Beta Series. For these webinars, we partner with leading portfolio managers to provide complete 360-degree analysis of how to invest in different asset classes using ETFs. The format today is very straightforward. Mabane is going to kick things off with a 15-minute presentation covering how he approaches sectors, including how he researches the space and how he decides which areas of the markets are most attractive. He's covering the alpha of the series. We'll then bring Matt in to the discussion to cover the beta portion with his own 15-minute presentation on understanding, evaluating, and trading different sector classification systems and ETFs. Following Matt's presentation, there'll be a moderated Q&A with all of the panelists. As a participant in this webinar, you can enter questions for any of the panelists during the entire session simply by going to the Q&A tool on the lower right-hand portion of your screen. Please don't wait until the end to ask questions. You can submit them as they occur to you. We'll then collate the questions submitted throughout the webinar and answer as many as we can at the end. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Mabain. Meb? Hey there. Can you guys hear me OK? All right, uh, let's get started. So thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. We're going to kind of whip through this presentation pretty quick. Got a lot of slides, so uh, hopefully um, we can uh, leave some room for questions after if I'm moving too fast. Uh, what we're talking about today, you know, specifically about sectors, is uh, using various types of momentum strategies. This is something we think a lot about, um, not just in U.S. sectors, but globally as well, uh, for many asset classes. And we, we've spent a lot of time doing research here. Um, there's some more information for people that want to look at uh, some more in-depth academic papers. We've got a couple that we've published over the last few years. Um, one's called a Quant Approach to Tactical Asset Allocation. That's been out since um, 2007. A more recent one uh, that focused on relative strength strategies uh, has been out since April 2010. And of course, our book, uh, The IV Portfolio, which touches on a number of topics. So let's get started. Uh, next slide. So the three areas we're going to talk about when people are talking about momentum are, are all related kind of cousins of each other. The first is, is trend following, uh, which we're looking at on any one asset class or sector. That's kind of a time series investment. Uh, two is relative strength type of strategies. That's comparing across sectors. So not just looking at are we do we like financials or not, but do we like financials relative to utilities or tech stocks. Uh, and three, and then uh, a unique way of combining the two for possibly um, alpha returns, but also a reduction in, in risk as well. Uh, next, uh, next slide. So one of the one of the key tenets of you know investing um, that when when we're talking about alpha is just not getting the beta returns, but um, what's very important to to us is is managing your risk. Uh, Buffett's got a very famous quote that the first rule is not to lose. The second rule is not to forget the first rule, and this is so important because compounding works on both sides. Uh, people emotionally, intuitively know this, uh, but on the actual um, thinking about their investment plan, rarely implement it. So uh, next slide. One of the key features of investing has been uh, that, that investment booms and busts are consistent throughout history, not just in the past decade here and in, in real estate and commodities, uh, U.S. stocks and the dot-com crash, but if you look back 300 years, uh, you know, this is, this is an example of a, 
um, investment company in the eight, early 18th century where, um, you know, famous scientist Sir Isaac Newton um, showed all of the, the typical behavioral biases that we have today uh, where he invests and, in you know, makes some money and his neighbors invest. Uh, and then make a lot of money and then proceed to lose all of his money. This chart could look exactly like um, a CMGI chart or something from, say, 2000 to 2003. Uh, this is probably, you know, very, very similar emotions it generates for people. Um, so, what, you know, how do, we, how do we avoid this in invest investing? Next slide. So this, the, the simplest example is a trend following example. So um, the most often talked about example of trend following for those that aren't familiar is a long term moving average. This is a very simple, I believe this is a, a 10 month moving average, very similar to the 200 day moving average. Um, but all this is trying to do is eliminate the noise and come up with a signal. So to be able to say, look, there's sometimes when we want to step aside from markets, sometimes we want to be in markets and really try to avoid the long drawdowns, avoid the long bear markets that, that can really damage your investment portfolio. So in this, the red line is a long moving average. The blue line is, 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 a, is a return stream, in this case, U.S. stocks. An investor wants to be invested when above the long-term moving average and out in the safety of cash or T-bills when below. Um, next slide. So how would how would this have done? Um, being a quant, you know, we want to look back and make sure that we understand the properties of this. Uh, this takes a look at U.S. stocks uh, as represented by what would have been the S&P 500 back to 1928. You can do this with Dow or other indices. Um, it takes a, just a very simple long-term moving average. You're investing in the equity market when above, out when below on a monthly basis. Uh, you simply move to cash when out of the market, getting cash returns. Um, and what this does is, sorry, this breaks this out into the 10 U.S. sectors. We're using FAMA French data here um, and treating each sector independently. So you're either in or out tech stocks, you're either in or out utility stocks. And what this does is this, um, you can be anywhere from 100% invested in the sectors to 100% in cash and bonds. And what you see here um, is the returns are very similar. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions about um, trend following type of strategies is that by in and of themselves they're not absolute return enhancing, uh, but rather uh, volatility reducing. So if you look at the volatility as measured by standard deviation, if you look at the maximum drawdown, both are reduced significantly. Um, one of the reasons because you spend a good amount of time in cash. And we, the papers in the book get into a lot of reasons why trend following works, um, not only on a statistical level, but also on a, on a behavioral level level, fundamental level why it works, but this just goes to show, and, and you know, to be fair, 80 years ago, the commissions and the transaction costs would have impacted these returns much more than today when we have commission-free ETF trading, maybe $8 trading, very little bit in NAS, but just goes to show the properties of this type of model. Next slide. Um, and then a simple equity curve that just goes to show, look, you're, you're not, you know, um, getting much, much increased compound returns, but rather avoiding the long bear markets uh, and, and ending up at the, in a, um, the same, roughly the same place over time, but avoiding the 80, 90 percent down markets. Next slide. Um, so it's one of the problems that people have, and one, one famous financial commentator was just writing an article about this the other day, is that you know, this doesn't necessarily um, compare apples to oranges, the trend following approach, because on an absolute level. So if you would rather use an approach that's a relative strength, uh, what some people call a cross-market momentum uh, model, then, then you can have for similar levels of volatility, you're showing the outperformance. So in this case, what we're doing, we're looking at the same 10 sectors. We're comparing total return. Um, you know, th th all the academic studies show that there, there's uh, outperformance anywhere from one month on out to, say, 14 or 16 months. So all we do is we take an average of one to 12 month returns, total returns, including dividends, and rank the, the U.S. sectors, one to 10. So in this case, this chart shows if you just took the top one sector every month based on those rolling returns, you would have beaten the equal weighted benchmark by uh, six percentage points a year. So wonderful out, out, wonderful returns. You still have the same volatility and drawdown as, um, as, the, as the buy and hold benchmark, however, but you do outperform about 70 percent of all years. However, there's a ton of turnover, you know, almost 400 um, percent, you know, in and out for, for this type of thing. So 
what you, from a portfolio perspective, that's still very difficult for people to deal with. You're losing 70, 80% of their money, only having their money invested in, say, one sector. So you can move that down to, say, top two sectors or top three, which would represent the top 20 or 30% of the entire universe. Still have 3 to 4% outperformance, um, possibly a little benefit of diversification uh, rather than all your eggs in one basket, and of course, less turnover. And there's a lot of things you can do to tweak this to reduce the turnover, et cetera. Um, but just as a simple example, a, a momentum type of system cross market can produce, say, three to, I think six is high, but three to four percent outperformance over time. And this has shown up in all sorts of other markets. Next slide. Um, a simple equity equity curve of the chart shows that it's worked for the past 80 years, um, done a nice job of, of having consistent returns. Uh, next slide. And one of the, the most interesting approaches to me is combining the two and saying, look, I want to go for alpha type of returns, but I also want to understand that there's times when I don't want to be sitting having to be invested in long bear markets. And so one of the difficulties you see with a lot of the sector rotation funds out there is they, they rotate, but they never have the ability to move to cash. And so if you have an 80, 90% bear market, if you have bear markets like we did in the 30s or this last one or Japan's currently in, the inability to move to cash can really really hurt a portfolio because it doesn't matter if you're down 40 when everything else is down 60, you're still down 40. So what we do is we take the best of these two systems. So we're ranking, um, we start with the relative strengths so or rank the sectors by their their uh, return. However, we, you, if that sector happens to be below its long-term trend, you just simply put that bucket into cash. So in this case, this is using, I think, the top two, so the top 20% of, um, of the available universe. And what you can see is it gets the, the combination model, gets similar returns, alpha returns is the relative strength, but it does so with less risk, so less volatility and less drawdown. It still has a significant drawdown, losing 50% of your available money, but not nearly as devastating as an 80% drawdown. So you can kind of get some of the benefits of the alpha returns with some of the, uh, without some of the drawbacks of, of, of just a uh, buy and hold type of investment. Uh, next slide. So what's working now, I updated this last night, uh, the top three U.S. sectors looking at energy, healthcare, and real estate, all of them are uh, in long-term uptrends, all of them have been doing well, uh, especially healthcare uh, year to date. Uh, next slide. And then, you know, this is a very simple model. We're trying to cram a lot into 10, 15 minutes here, but there's, there's a number of improvements. There's a number of, um, you know, ways you can take a simple model like this. The first, obviously, is more asset classes, so expanding into, uh, you know, uh, foreign stocks, into bonds, all the various types of bonds, into real estate, into commodities, into currencies, um, as long as they're not perfectly correlated, can all have additional benefits of diversification to the portfolio. Um, you can move further granularity within an asset class using these U.S. sectors as one example, but instead of trading, say, foreign developed, uh, you could trade U U.K., France, Switzerland, Germany. As long as they're not perfectly correlated, you get you get a bump in the risk-adjusted returns. Uh, another possibility is using multiple time frames and so not just relying on one time frame indicator, I'd say the 200-day moving average uh, for, for a binary type of outcome, but rather spreading it across Across you know multiple uh, multiple time frames in our public ETF, you know we're using over 80 uh, 80 underlying funds as well as um, you know multiple time frames to, to get a blend of all possible outcomes. And then one of the this was a pure price based uh, technical quantitative type of system, but there's other things that, that could be combined with this to help smooth out returns. The most obvious is a mean reversion or value type of strategy uh, to be able to pick uh, mark sectors that are, that are um, rebounding rather than trending, and of course, economic type of factors, being able to input uh, factors that might, might diverge from price, whether it's real interest rates or yield curve or PE ratios, all of which could be used to, to blend this type of system. So I think that's my last my last slide, and I'll uh, I'll hand it back off to you guys and uh, stick around for questions after. Thanks, Meb. Uh, I think that's a nice overview of you know one approach investors can use to investing in the sector market. Certainly a popular one, and we have some good questions coming up in the Q and A about that. I'm going to take my 15 minutes to tackle things from a more fundamental basis, going back to the beginning of what makes a sector a sector. 
and how that translates into investor returns. Because I, I think as often as the case with investing, this is one area where doing just a little bit of research can have a major impact on the returns you get. And, and I think this is overlooked by many investors. So at the heart of any sector strategy lies one major problem, which I like to call the jelly bean problem. You read the headlines and maybe you decide, maybe you're following Momo uh, indicators, but you decide that financials are going to go up. But what do you mean by that? Well, let's imagine that all the tens of thousands of companies in the world are in a jelly bean jar at the church fair. Saying you want access to financials is like saying you only want to eat the red jelly beans. But you're not actually going to go into the jar and pull them all out by hand. Instead, you need someone else to go through the jar and get only the red ones. Uh, the problem is that companies like Jelly Beans aren't perfectly uniform. So how do you know you're really only getting the red ones? That's where the classification system comes in. And as I said, few investors pay attention to the classification systems that underlie different sector ETFs. But they do so at their peril because understanding exactly what market a given sector index captures is a key to getting the exposure you want. So for the most part, ETFs and index companies rely on one of two major classification schemes to, dis to guide these decisions, the Global Industry Classification Standard, or GICS, and the Industry Classification Benchmark, or ICB. Both GICS and ICB were created with the same general purpose, to create useful distinctions between different types of companies. But despite the similar goals, the end result of the two systems differ. S&P and Morgan Stanley developed the GIC standard in 1999. It looks at roughly 35,000 companies and divides them into four different levels, 10 sectors, 24 industry groups, 68 industries, and 154 sub-industries. Companies are reviewed on an annual basis and assigned to those segments based on their principal business activity, which S&P and Morgan Stanley define as the source of each company's revenues. The system also looks at the source of each company's earnings as well as prevailing market opinion to decide where each company goes. The other system, ICB, was developed by Dow Jones and FTSE in 2004. The ICB universe of companies is much larger, covering about 60,000 companies, but like GICs, it also divides them into four levels, 10 sectors, 19 super sectors, 41 sectors, and 114 subsectors. Again, like GICs, ICB assigns companies to sectors according to the primary source of revenues. One key difference between the two systems is simply the number of companies each system classifies. In a very real way, starting with a smaller number of companies can limit the depth of what's available to sector ETFs. A second difference is, even though both systems assign firms based on the source of their revenues, the resulting classifications differ because the two systems use different buckets and definitions. What is a financial company to one system is not necessarily a financial company to another. And we'll look at this closely in a minute. Thirdly, the systems deal with companies that operate more than one line of business differently. Under the ICB system, if a company possesses two or more business lines, indexers turn to audited, publicly available accounting information and director reports. ICB reserves the right to classify stocks either by the industrial process they employ or by their end products, a decision that's not always transparent or obvious to investors. GIGS is actually a bit more of a black box with multi-line businesses, though it does state that earnings and market perception factor into its classification criteria. Throughout, seemingly minor discrepancies in classification methodology can result in major differences in the resulting indexes. So here's the top cut, and this probably lines up with how you think about sectors. You'll generally see one of these two lists in every portfolio analysis, fund fact sheet, or Yahoo Finance page you look at. And with one exception, the two systems line up very well at this level. That exception is the consumer space, where the competing systems are very different. GICS looks at consumer stocks from the standpoint there are things consumers can and cannot live without. It reasons that demand for those products, and therefore the related stock performance, will vary with the state of the economy. By that view, consumer discretionary companies should be more directly tied to the business cycle than consumer staples. ICB takes a different view. It sorts companies into consumer goods or consumer services. 
Consumer goods includes companies which produce tangible products, from food to autos to jewelry. Consumer services includes companies that deliver those tangible goods, like retailers, or provide services and non-physical goods, like movie studios or telemarketers. Reasonable people can disagree on which approach is better, and we'll present some data on that in a minute. But before we do, I thought I'd point out that GIX and ITB are not the only classification systems out there. Other systems to keep in mind include the Thomson Reuters business classification system and sector systems from Russell and Zacks. To me, TRBC is particularly interesting. It hasn't been deployed in the ETF market, but there are many reasons why it may be the most effective one for ETF construction in the future. TRC assembles the broadest starting universe of securities with around 74,000 companies, giving it the most potential components with which to populate sectors. Like GIX and ICB, it uses revenue to determine a company's primary line of business, but takes the most standardized track of the three classifications, relying on three different accounting metrics before moving on to a discretionary choice of where to put each company. This decreases the likelihood a company will be classified by opinion, and when we checked a number of edge case businesses, we found that TRBC tends to classify companies more in line with their true strategic business model than either GIX or ICB. Take Amazon. TRBC sorts Amazon into its discount store subdivision, the same classification used for many brick-and-mortar retailers. ICB classifies Amazon similarly as a broadline retailer, but GIX moves Amazon into the internet retailers category. Clearly, reasonable people can and do disagree about Amazon, and a case can be made for both divisions. But the company has clearly indicated its primary business model is to sell high volumes of goods to consumers at a discount. Its true competition is far more Walmart than it is eBay. Therefore, in this case, we find the TRBC and ICB definitions more accurate. While we don't completely agree with any systems classification of every stock, time and again the logic seems to hold out at the individual security level for TRBC. Unfortunately, while that makes TRBC a great analytics tool, it doesn't help investors until someone launches a product tied to the system. There are two other major systems out there that you hear about a bit, one from Russell and one from Zacks. Both are proprietary. Russell has leveraged and sector and inverse sector ETFs tied to their Russell 1000 energy, financial, and tech indexes. Zacks has a proprietary system that starts with 17 sectors at the top level and goes down to a very granular level of detail. It's the basis for XRO, the sector, sector rotation ETF. For an investor looking to make a broad sector strategy play, like the one Meb discussed, neither system is particularly useful, though. You're left with GIX and ICB. So let's take a closer look at those using SPY as the proxy for the S&P 500 to see how they divide the market. Not surprisingly, the two classification systems are remarkably similar in their net holdings, with only a few percentage point differences separating most categories. The largest variation can be seen in IT slash tech, where GIX considers the S&P 500 to be 2% more in tech than ICB. When we expand into the international arena, however, even those distinctions go away and the breakdowns get very similar. But that doesn't mean that the underlying indexes are the same, just that the weights match up. This chart shows the real story. This chart plots the four major consumer sector ETFs. Those are the iShares series, tickers IYC and IYK, which track ICB indexes, and are shown in the thin blue and gray lines in the chart. The State Street Select Sector Spider ETFs, ticker XLP and XLY, track GIX-based indexes and are shown in the fat red and yellow lines. The two top lines represent staples and goods, and the bottom lines represent discretionary and services. As a sector investor, what you really want is for these lines to be as different as possible. After all, if your two consumer sectors performed identically, why bother to separate them? And just intuitively, you can tell that the thick-line GIX-based ETFs have had more divergent performance recently, to the tune of a 40% greater return differential since 2005. What's going on here? Well, it's all about correlations. Over the long haul, the key to a good sector index is having like companies identified with like companies. This chart looks at how correlated the two consumer categories are within each system. 
the 0.89 correlation for ICB over one year means that last year the consumer goods and consumer services sectors in the ICB classification system were highly correlated. Over time, you'll notice two things, however. First, all the correlations come down over time, suggesting that these various indexes have indeed captured different kinds of performance. Second, the gap between the different classification methodologies widens as well, suggesting that some have been better and some have been worse at capturing those performance differences. We've put TRBC on the slide to highlight one of the reasons we like it. The correlation between competing consumer segments is the lowest over the of the three over the long haul by a significant margin. So what causes these different correlations? They happen when you end up with companies on both sides of the fence that are very similar. For some stocks, the two main systems agree. Hasbro, Nike, and Ford are all listed as consumer discretionary in GICs and consumer goods in ICB. But companies like Amazon.com, Big Lots, Best Buy, and Staples are split. GIX considers them discretionary companies as well, but ICB splits them into consumer services. Again, what's right can be debated, but over recent history, the GIX model focusing on business cycles has created groups of more similar stocks in the consumer space than the ICB model. Outside of consumer, the differences reduce. In most sectors, the different systems produce nearly identical results. Here's four and a half years of energy returns. It takes a magnifying glass to see a significant difference. And while GIX won by a few percentage points in this time frame, if you roll back a few months, ICB would have come out the victor. Even in a sector as volatile as financials, where you think that being in or out of a particular name would matter, the GIX and ICB approaches have yielded surprisingly similar results. Still, the 10% win in favor of ICB on this slide, represented by the IYF ETF, should make you want to look under the hood. So let's do that. In this and the next few slides, we use TRBC as a neutral benchmark. This slide looks at all eight large cap companies that TRBC classifies as financials, which we believe are misclassified by either GICs or ICB. One of the main differences is that TRBC classifies companies usually seen as health insurance companies like Aetna and Cigna as financials. The question is whether you think these companies will respond to external forces on healthcare more or less than they will to external forces on financials. History would suggest that these are insurance companies first and foremost and not healthcare companies. Moving on to other firms, TRBC agrees with ICB that MasterCard and Visa are financial companies, whereas GIX considers them tech companies. Again, both systems do have large technology networks, but to us, their fortunes are much more tied to lenders than they are to Microsoft. You can see how each system arrives at its conclusion, but the question is, which one is right? Here's another way to look at your financial sector exposure. Where are your investments getting polluted with potentially non-sector exposure? Here are nine securities that GIX labels as financials, which TRBC has assigned to other categories. In this case, a paper company like Weyerhaeuser gets classified as a financials firm because it generates REIT-like income, despite the fact that most people might think this is primarily a pulp and paper company. You see a lot of the same differences in the ICB system. Here's where I would point out that nothing's perfect. Western Union makes most of its money from two things, money transfer fees and foreign exchange. Both of those strike me firmly as financial activities. And on this one, it looks like TRBC got it wrong and ICB got it right. Things get even more complicated and important when evaluating sector ETFs when you mix classification systems with varying weighting methodologies. This chart shows the performance of all broad-based financial ETFs since 2009. I've left the GICs and ICB funds in red and yellow, and you can see that over this period, their performance has been nearly identical, up around 30%. But that's not true of other funds, which varied between up 70% and up 12% over the same time frame. The best of the bunch was the Rydex S&P Equal Weight Financial ETF, which tracks an equally weighted index of financial stocks pulled from the S&P 500. The worst was the PowerShares Dynamic Financial Portfolio, or PFI, which tracks a quant-driven index of U.S. financial companies. But if you look at the bear market, we had almost exactly the opposite pattern of returns, 
with RYF being one of the worst performers and PFI being one of the best. So what's happening here? As you'd expect, it all comes down to holdings. RYF draws from the same portfolio of securities as the large cap XLF, holding firms in the S&P 500. That gave it significant exposure to mainline Wall Street banks that were at the heart of the sell-off in 2008 and at the heart of the recovery in 2009 and 2010. PFI, on the other hand, follows a quant-driven strategy that can push it into smaller firms and can tilt its portfolio more in favor of community banks, insurance companies, and similar firms. These acted as a kind of defensive ballast on the way down, but consequently didn't rally during the run-up nearly as much as those mainline Wall Street banks. The point is, the choice of ETF matters. You can see here the wide range in performance statistics, volatilities, and sharp ratios for ETFs that claim to be broad-based financial ETFs. The only way to know what you're getting is to actually crack open each fund and look under the hood. The importance of deciding what a financial stock is is nothing compared to the importance of defining an even narrower universe. Take biotech, for instance. Each of the five major ETFs in this space takes a very different approach to the biotech market, and as you can see, they have had wildly different results. The old BBH Biotech Holders, for, for example, is phenomenally undiversified, acting as a package of convenience to own Amgen, Gilead, and Biogen, which together make up a staggering 75% of the portfolio. That hurt returns in the time period charted here. FBT, the top performer in the space recently, is the First Trust Biotech Fund, which is heavily concentrated in tools makers and weight stocks equally. While it's got positions in Amgen and Gilead, it also has many smaller cap, more flyer type companies that have really paid off recently. As you'd expect, these five very different funds have five very different best and worst case scenarios. While your best case has been up 170% in FBT in the last two years, your worst case in that fund has been down almost 37%. BBH's upside has been more muted, but its largest drawback was just 3%. The point, again, is that what's under the hood really matters, and once you get below the surface of the top 10 sectors, you can no longer rely on simple distinctions between GIX and ICB. You really have to do your homework and evaluate the holdings. One more area of the market before we open it up to questions. Themes. Themes are tricky, not so much from a classification perspective, but from a does it work perspective. This chart compares the performance of two wind energy ETFs, FAN from First Trust and PWND from PowerShares. The two charts look very similar over the long haul, but at times they have been as much as 20% apart. What drives this difference, and a key factor that drives all thematic indexes and which you should pay attention to before you invest, is the pure play question. FAN holds more companies than PWND, 58 names versus 30, but it does so in part by diversifying into big energy companies like BP and Shell, which have exposure to the wind business but are inarguably old energy. FAN's methodology breaks the world into two pieces, companies that operate exclusively in the wind energy business, which account for two-thirds of the portfolio, and conglomerates that do touch on wind, but for which that's not their primary business activity, account for the remaining one-third. PWND focuses more on pure plays in the wind space, ignoring conglomerates that make up one-third uh, one of FAN. Which makes the most sense? The market actually favors FAN at this point, which has by far the bulk of assets and has outperformed in recent months. It depends on your view of how the wind sector will develop over the coming years. Will those large-scale conglomerates carry the day, or will the smaller, more pure-play companies benefit more from growth in the wind sector? None of this talk is designed to scare you off. Broadly speaking, sector ETFs deliver on their promise, providing exposure to specific economic themes that matter to investors. But the systems do vary significantly, and as indicated, choosing the right sector index and ETF can often be as important, if not more important, than choosing the right sector to begin with. With that, I'd love to bring in my panelists, Meb Faber of Cambria Asset Management and David Botset of Guggenheim. 
As a reminder, as a participant in this webinar, you can ask questions of me or my panelists by using the chat interface in the webinar application. We will collate the questions and answer as many as we can by the end of this chat. To forestall one question we get asked repeatedly, a copy of these slides and a recording of the presentation will be sent to everyone who registered for this webinar within the next few days via email. That email will include information about how to qualify for CE credits for attending this webinar live. And with that, David, I want to ask you um, the first question, which is really about thematic indexes. You know, there's a big debate about the pure play question and how pure play um, thematic indexes should be and thematic ETFs should be, whether or not they should include those conglomerates or exclude them. I wanted to know your thinking on the value uh, of creating a, a pure pure play index versus including a, a broader spectrum of companies. Thanks, Matt. And, and I wanted to say first and foremost, thanks for everybody joining us today and having me to be a part of this call. You know, the, the question you ask is a good one, and it's one that we debate internally very often. And I think ultimately, as we talk to advisors, uh, the end result is really understanding how the advisor views that area of the market and their outlook. And, and ultimately, I believe there is a play for both of those types of products to exist in the market. In some respects and in some markets, the smaller, purer play company uh, oftentimes are, are can perform better, outperform the conglomerate because they are more directly tied to that particular industry. In the example you provided in the wind industry, uh, you can see that over time, some of those smaller, purer plays will tend to outperform. But on the reverse thinking, uh, you, you look at some of the large conglomerates, and ultimately they have perhaps the long-term horsepower that will really put them in the forefront of these industries. While they may not be in the forefront of the industries today, ultimately they, they may be in the position to really win out. So I think it, it, it many times depends on the timing within, the, within their investment as to whether one is going to perform better or another is going to perform better over time. And I think there really is a place for both to exist both in the marketplace today and potentially exist as viable investment solutions uh, within a client's portfolio. Great. And one, one more question, then we'll turn it over for, for Meb. I mean, you know, a lot of times advisors face a choice where there's an established ETF and there's maybe a new ETF that they like better, um, but which doesn't have assets or trading volume. How, do, how, how worried should they be if a fund doesn't have significant assets? You know, that, that's a great question and one that, that we're asked very frequently, whether it be with a, a new product or an existing product that's been in the market uh, for a period of time. And it's certainly something of consideration because it's, it's never uh, an answer that you want to have to give your client that uh, a product has been closed or delisted. But ultimately, I, I think that we as product sponsors understand that thematic products need time in the market in order to really prove themselves from both an investment standpoint as well as when the opportunity presents itself to be invested in that area of the market. As Meb talked about, there is this notion of, of being able to invest your portfolio based upon themes, whether that be um, trend-based or relative strength. So things are going in and out of favor over time, and we as product sponsors understand that and know that over time, our products may be either in favor or out of favor and, and need to provide those products an adequate time in the market to, to gain market share and, and grow assets. Now, that being said, as you're, as you're looking at those smaller asset-based products, I think one of the most important things to understand is, is how you trade those. So I would encourage all advisors to really talk to their trading desks and, and their execution teams about the best way to execute trades appropriately in, in gaining that exposure. And Meb, I want to kick that over to you. So you're, you're both, uh, you know, you, you have a, a system that's packaged into an ETF, but you're also a, an end investor. Um, you know, particularly in the sector space, there are a lot of very small ETFs out there. Um, what, what's your approach to that? What do you think about when you look at those narrower, um, perhaps niche sector ETFs? Uh, do, do you, are you willing to go there or do you stay away? Um. There's a couple a couple areas. One, in general, we're willing to go there, um, you know, because we trade so many underlying ETFs, uh, upwards of 80 to 100 
they constitute a very small portion of the portfolio. Many of them are, you know, 0.5 percent of the entire portfolio. That having been said, um, you know, we don't want to be a large part of the underlying asset. So if the ETF is trading, say, less than 100 million, you know, it's not something that that's that's kind of the base level. You know, screen, and as we grow, you know, our fund is about 170 million. If that's 500 million, two billion, uh, you know, some of the smaller niche ones may fall off. But that having said, that the ETF industry is growing so fast that uh, the assets and liquidity and volume and a lot of these newer products are are growing every day. So it's becoming less of an issue. And then, to the extent we get even bigger, you know, we we have the ability to use futures and options. So it's a consideration, um, but one that um, you know. Is, is on the list of five other areas of liquidity and representativeness of the index and you know, uh, fee structure, et cetera. But it, it is very certainly something we look at. And another another question we've had from the audience is, you know, the, the whole approach you laid out is fairly mechanical, but you did mention at the end value analysis and um, um, economic analysis. When, if ever, do you override uh, those those technical signals? And if you don't in your existing products, how would you combine those two things without letting you know sort of emotion erode the advantages of the mechanical system? Well, that's that's the the biggest benefit of having a mechanical system is you're not letting your emotions get involved. You're not reacting emotionally to say the Japanese tsunami or reacting emotionally to what's going on in the markets in the fall of 2008. But that you have a plan before the event occurs. Um, you know, all the Dalbar studies, all the timing studies show that people are horrific at um, you know timing markets. They 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 over and over not only individuals but professionals as well buy at tops and sell at bottoms. So having a mechanical um, approach is very important to us. That having been said, I'm agnostic as to the type of me uh, mechanical approach as long as that it works. So the price-based types of approaches we talked about today have decades, if not centuries, of data on all, all the various asset classes and have worked in, in you know, virtually all of them. And that's very important. Any approach you have should work in um, all asset classes you know, most of the time, so across decades. Um, as far as the value and, uh, you know, ec econometric type of approaches, um, there's many that certainly work. Value is by far one of the best. How you measure it is, is certainly considered excuse me, a consideration, as is economic variables. The one difficulty in most of those is that, you know, they, they can diverge from price. Markets can keep getting cheaper or keep getting more expensive, as the case of the U.S. equities in the 90s. Um, and so we always, at the end of the day, want to have the uh, price-based approach um, to be on the right side of the market and be able to get out and cut our losses when, when they're doing poorly. Right. David, I want to ask you one more question about thematic ETFs, um, just because Guggenheim is so strong in that area. You know, how do you decide when a theme is legitimate or when it's not? We see lots of ETFs launch um, on, on various thematic schema. Some seem like marketing messages and some seem like they do have a place in a portfolio. You know, how should an advisor make that decision about evaluating a new theme? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question and one that, that we debate with. And, and I think if you look in the market, a question that we often get is, is, is the market too subdivided? Are there too many ETFs? And I think there are certainly instances in, in the marketplace where you could perhaps make the argument that uh, we don't need to be as granular as the ETF is providing exposure to. But what we really look to to drive our uh, process and, and thoughts around developing new products and bringing them to market is, is historically, as a starting point, where have institutional investors placed their assets? And can we deliver a product to the market that would allow a retail customer to gain very similar exposure and be able to allocate their portfolios in a similar mechanism or a similar way? I think the other thing that we look to is historically, what does this area of the market provide um, in terms of a benefit to being additive um, being an additive allocation within a portfolio. You know, does it drive excess returns? Is it lowly correlated so that overall it uh, reduces your volatility? And if you can, you can understand those and you, you make the, the, um, the allocation and it does in fact provide that excess return, a lower a standard deviation over time, I think it, it very much provides a, a valid 
um, product to track and, and, and a valid um, allocation within a, a client's portfolio. That's a, that's a great question. So one from the audience that ties right into that is with many of these ETFs uh, being so new and having such a short life, uh, how can advisors get access to historical data to, um, you know, evaluate the long-term role that that ETF might have in a portfolio? Uh, you know, from, from our perspective, um, we, we unfortunately are not in a position typically to be able to, for, uh, to use the back test to, to market a new product. But generally, when we are evaluating a new product, the index sponsor that we are licensing uh, for the basis of the product will have conducted and performed some type of back test. So that's typically a very good place to start is, is either a direct connection with the index provider or uh, in, in the case that the index provider has published the information and made it available publicly through Bloomberg um, or through, uh, in many cases, the index universe tools that you're developing. You can see those back tested. You can perform the analysis to understand the additive uh, or the benefit, rather, of that product being added to a portfolio. Absolutely. One one question related to that, or, or somewhat related to that, which I'm going to toss to Meb, um, which I get a lot, is concerns about rising sector correlations. Um, do, do you think you still are getting real significant um, distributions of returns between the various sectors, or are you concerned with rising uh, correlations? So, well, we start from a different perspective in that, you know, we're not assuming uh, the correlations are stable. So, you know, many people kind of come at it from the perspective of assuming that they're going to get this huge diversification benefit. But what you find is in 2008, a lot of people learned is that, um, you know, diversification works except in many cases when, when you really want it to work, which is in a, in a, in a vast market panic. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of take a step back and say, look, you know, we go in our fund, we go beyond just U.S. stocks and the foreign stocks and bonds and real estate and commodities and currencies. But, you know, when there's a big down market within one market, so U.S. stocks, we fully expect these, these um, you know, and stocks at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if they're utilities or tech, are much riskier than other asset classes. So that we, we expect that correlation to move to uh, very high levels. Um, you, now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't diversify your assets. You very much should. But I think one of the, 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 one of the things that people are going to really start to look for in the coming years is other asset classes or approaches that don't correlate to your typical, um, you know, modern portfolio theory on the typical publicly available asset classes. And I think that will be uh, an opportune area for both advisors and product developers going forward. That's, that's very interesting. Well, I want to get back to that, but we have a specific question about your uh, strategy, Meb, which is how do you how do you rebalance? What is the appropriate rebalancing band for a strategy like this? Do you um, do you cut it off immediately? Do you have ten percent wings? What do you do? Right. So the, in all of our papers and books we've written, you know, we're trying to just show something that's instructive rather than the specific best case scenario. And for many people, uh, the types of ways they rebalance or the ways they use these mechanical systems can vary widely. Uh, so, you know, when our, in our public ETF, we're rebalancing weekly, you know, across 80 to 100 underlying funds. But for somebody who's managing his portfolio, um, you know, and only wants to look at it once a month, it's a total a different scenario and different time frame. That having been said, on a buy and hold type of portfolio, um, you know, a rebalancing type of returns, it matters, but it only matters as long as you do it sometime. Um, it doesn't even matter if you do it monthly or quarterly or even yearly. If you did it every three years, it's, it's really fine, but you have to do it sometime. As far as our trading signals, um, you know, it, it really depends on the individual, but broadly over the next 10 years, it doesn't really matter if you use the 200-day moving average on a monthly monthly level or the 50-day moving average on a weekly level, those type of things will wash out in the long run, although in the short term they'll have very different return paths. So we use a whole number. Um, and then I think the question may be touching on, um, you know, what's the tolerance level as far as uh, when an asset class appreciates. So if, if gold or silver has now gone up 50 or 100%, um, you know, when do you, when do you rebalance back to your base case allocation? And again, that's kind of a 
up to the investor type of thing. Is a 20% ban reasonable? 30%, 40%, you know, it, it, 20%, something like that is, I think, reasonable. But again, it's, it's very uh, specific to kind of what, what the individual's circumstance may be. Right. Uh, David, I want to throw this one out to you. This is from the audience. Uh, they, they mentioned, you know, there's a proliferation of new tactical models, ETFs of ETFs. You know, without commenting on, on, on Guggenheim's products, how do you, or how should an advisor look at this growing field? You know, it seems like a new one launches every week. How should they evaluate which one makes sense for them? Um, should they wait for the product to be seasoned? What should they do when these new ETF of ETFs come to market? You know, I think the first thing to, to really understand is, is much like you covered in understanding how uh, various entities assign companies to sectors or industries, it's really digging in deep and understanding the model with which uh, the allocations are made within the ETF. Um, that's the most important uh, portion of, of the evaluation and really validating that model. You know, I think as, as people come to us and ask us questions about what stock do, do we put into a back test, whether it be from a tactical uh, portfolio or, or a, uh, an index itself, is, you know, we need to look at it. We need to understand what that has meant over time. But more importantly, we need to understand if, in fact, it, it posted good performance, why it did that, and is that sustainable going forward? And I think that is the, the element that you need to really understand. Understand what were the drivers of performance. You know, talk to your representative at, at the ETF sponsor and understand what drove that performance and ultimately is that sustainable over time. And also understand that did it outperform or underperform the market during certain periods of time? You know, are there specific indicators in the market that will say, X, uh, X sponsor's product will outperform during this period versus another sponsor's during a different period of time. Understand those differences, those nuances, and, and that will ultimately help you validate the product and a near-term investment or a pro an investment that you think will be made in the future after you see performance really posted and see how it actually performs in the market. Meb, does that line up with the way you think? I mean, you have a product out there, but not commenting specifically on that. You know, how do you want people to to approach? Uh, well, we can go right there. How do you want people to approach your product and evaluate it and decide if it's right for them? Well, what you're starting to see, and it's actually really interesting, is that you know we designed it very much as a core uh, holding. So GTA could be. I mean, it, it holds the underlying securities. You know, over 15,000 underlying securities around the world. So it's designed as a core holding for your entire portfolio. That having been said, you know, we talk to a lot of advisors that use it as a satellite or a risk manager. Or and it's funny because Morningstar just reclassified us into the multi alternative bucket, which I'm not really even sure what that is. But um, you know, we're, we're one of the new ETFs in there. Um, that having been said, you know, a lot of these active ETFs that are coming out, you know, you just got to take a step back and. And say, look, what is are they doing? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, in our case, you know, we're much different than a um, sector or thematic ETF, and that people are often using those for trading exposure or very specific niche exposure to, to something. Their worldview, you know, ours is a holistic sort of portfolio. Um, so, what I think we're we, from the conversations we've had, most people and advisors are using it as a, you know a buy and hold allocation, which you know, for many cases, a lot of ETFs hasn't been. The, one of the primary uses. Um, so hopefully not a lot of people are shorting it, but <laughs> so uh, mostly people see it as a kind of a core core type of holding. Interesting. I'm, I'm actually going to take a question here for myself. I got a question about, you know, uh, which I think will lead the way either, you know, actively managed ETFs or the active use of ETFs, um, of passive ETFs, uh, to create an active portfolio. And, and I think it's an it's a important and topical question. From my perspective, I think we're seeing more traction on the active use of passive ETFs as opposed to classic stock picking. I still think that the question is out whether a classic stock picking strategy works perfectly within an ETF structure. I think many of the top managers are reticent to, um, you know, uncover their complete holdings. I think that goes away when you have a portfolio of actively managed passive ETFs 
whether that's tied up in a fund wrapper or run by a model portfolio firm. I actually think some of the leading um, sort of investment superstars of the next decade are going to be model portfolio managers who use beta products in active ways. I see that as a massive theme. Um, so there, there's my one question. I, I had another question for David, and this was one of my favorite old products, which I was very sad to uh, to see disappear uh, when it couldn't get its proxy vote done. But SEA, which is the shipping ETF, uh, was a product that had significant assets and was forced to close um, during the Guggenheim merger uh, for really technical reasons, not because it wasn't a popular fund, um, but simply technical reasons related to the merger. And since then, it's been unable to achieve um, significant assets again. So I guess my question to you, David, is where do you think that money went, and do you think SEA will eventually come around and be a successful product again? Well, th thanks for the kind words, Matt. We, uh, we, we thought that product was a good product as well, and we're disappointed when we were unable to get sufficient votes to uh, reach a quorum uh, with the proxy. You know, I think it, it, this is a prime example of a product that can go in and out of favor. You know, when we launched this, uh, the original uh, shipping product uh, was a very robust economic period, and we saw a significant amount of assets move into that space as uh, shippers uh, around the world benefit from the moving of commodities and finished goods uh, to their final destination for use. And uh, those shipping companies were very robust, earning high uh, levels of earnings. And ultimately, um, the product generated a, a pretty nice yield, which is the way many people look at shipping companies as kind of a, a REIT on water. When we, uh, when we had to close the product and, and ultimately relaunch the product, uh, we were in the middle uh, uh, part of 2010, so about a year ago. And uh, what we've seen since the relaunch is, is that shipping companies really haven't uh, reemerged uh, from the uh, the global economic downturn. They, they've kind of been, uh, pardon the pun, but they're just kind of floating in the water right now. And and I think ultimately a product like this, from a from a allocation point of view benefits when we see the robustness return to the global economic environment, when shipping companies, again, are seeing higher demand, higher earnings, and, and higher yields on them. But in today's environment where, where they're not really growing, uh, we're seeing a, a little bit of stabilization in, uh, in their earnings. Uh, we don't see those, those assets returning as quickly. But again, long term, as a product sponsor, we, we think this has it's time in the market, um, and, and we'll receive those allocations uh, when when that recovery uh, happens for this this particular industry. Interesting. Last question for you, Meb. Um, uh, an interesting question. We see a lot of talk about sector uh, investing and momentum strategies. Have you looked at um, momentum strategies tied to the commodity future space, i.e., you know, oil versus corn versus wheat versus copper, um, or has ha has that sort of analysis not yet been done? No, so we, you know, spend a lot of time with uh, both the, the the trend following and relative strength strategies. You know, not just on U.S. sectors, but on global asset classes. Um, you know, on in, in the papers that we did, we're taking a look at the, on the global asset classes back to the '70s, and it works. I mean, it works. Um, in if you look back to the origins of most commodity trading funds, which were originally a lot of the trend following type of funds, uh, that's what they do. These big, huge managed futures funds, they're doing trend following on, um, in many cases, over 100 markets around the world on futures exchanges, and it's worked for very long time horizons. Hopefully, um, it's my hope that you're going to start to see more public managed futures funds coming out as ETFs. I think the first um, round have been a little suboptimal. You're seeing them in the, in the, in the um, uh, mutual fund space as well. They tend to be expensive, in some cases index-based, uh, but I, I'm hoping you're going to start to see a lot of the, you know, managed futures funds come out as active ETFs and hedge funds come out as active ETFs. You know, the, the it's it's been um, hedge funds have been listing in Europe for over a decade, and you're starting to see people dabble in it now. That the big announcements from Pimco and uh, a lot of these other shops doing active ETFs. I think it's really the first inning there. So yes, it works. And I'm really, that's one of the areas I think is a big opportunity uh, for product developers to put out these type of funds. Um, and, and that one area you talk about specifically, commodities, I know there's a, a few that, that touch on that area. But yes, the, the research has shown that it works in, uh, in most markets, uh, not just commodities and, and 
the U.S. stocks, but also currencies, real estate, bonds as well, and uh, over very long time horizons. I actually couldn't agree more. I think that's a major area uh, for product innovation, um, despite the study that came out today saying RIAs think they have enough commodity funds. Um, I think they need additional choices, and I think we'll see uh, tremendous innovation in that space. Um, so with that, that wraps up our hour. I want to thank uh, my panelists, Meb Faber and David Botset. Uh, from Cambria and Guggenheim, uh, respectively. For more information, you can go to any of our websites, indexuniverse.com, Cambria Investments, or mebanefaber.com, or guggenheimfunds.com. Uh, for those of you who attended this live, you will receive an email with a recording of this presentation and the slides, as well as information on how to qualify for CE credits. That will be coming in the email within the next few weeks. Thanks to everyone for attending. We'll see you at the next Index Universe webinar series. Uh, that's coming up next week, focused on China and China ETFs. If you haven't registered yet, do so today. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next week.